sound like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the first uh, episode of the Healthy Longevity Series by the National University of Singapore Yong, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. Um, I know you're all disappointed to see 2020 go away, but uh, we're, we have to face it. We're in 2021 now, and we're starting off with one of the best uh, lectures I can imagine by Steve Horvath. Uh, I'm e excited to introduce him in a few minutes. Uh, but before that, we're going to start with a new segment to the program, which is to have someone uh, in my lab uh, give an overview of a recent paper that we think is important in the aging research field. Uh, and so for that, I'm going to turn it over to Guan Ping, who's going to do that uh, overview. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Xiao Ping, a senior research fellow from Pro Brian Kennedy Lab at Center for Healthy Longevity. As mentioned by Prof. Kennedy, we'll be sharing some of the latest and most exciting discovery in the field of healthy longevity every time before an expert come on board. For a start, we'll be discussing a series of discovery about fasting and lifespan by Dr. Rafael Di Carbo Group that were recently published in Cell Metabolism. Since the discovery in early 1930s that reduced food intake extend the lifespan of red Calorie restriction, defined as a reduction of calorie without causing malnutrition, has been shown to extend the lifespan of a wide range of species. So to examine the effect of calorie restriction on human lifespan, researchers have been working on study of calorie restriction in non-human primate for over 30 years. However, study at the National Institute of Aging and at the University of Wisconsin demonstrated very different outcome in terms of survival, which created some controversy about the efficacy of calorie restriction in non-human primates. However, subsequent analysis found that there are methodolog methodological differences between the two sites, which mainly include the composition of the diet and their feeding regimen. Hence, Dr. DeCarbo Group set up the study whether the difference in diet composition and feeding regimen would lead to distinct outcome in terms of survival. In that study, the mice were divided into two diet groups. One group received the University of Wisconsin sucrose rich diet, and the other received the National Institute of Aging low sucrose diet, albeit with similar carbohydrate level. Mice within each diet group were then separated into one of the three feeding regimen at libidum, feeding 30% calorie restriction and a single meal per day feeding, which was initially introduced to control for calorific difference between the two diets, between uh, at libidum feeding and calorie restriction. Apparently, apparently, the time restricted one meal per day fat animal consume all calories within a few hours, resulting in a long daily fasting period. Compared with the mice, the time restricted feeding mice were healthier, live significantly longer. In fact, 11% longer 
and show a delayed onset of uh, fatty acid disease and hepatocellular carcinoma, even though they were consuming the same number of calories as the mice in ad libitum group. If calorie restriction is carried out and one meal a day is maintained, then life expectancy can be extended by 28%. So how was this type of time-restricted feeding has such a profound effect on long-term health and survival? To gain insight uh, into the metabolic and signaling pathway, uh, Dr. DiCabo and colleague repeated their experiment where the mice were still divided into three feeding regimens using similar diet plan and was fed for 20 months. After that, they performed an integrated analysis of data from mouse liver, transcription, and metabolite profile. They found that when compared with ad libitum mice, the specific pathway and reach under calorie restriction include detoxification, molecular turnover maintenance, and energy supply, while the pathway linked to central catabolism spanning glucose, amino acid, lipids, and nucleotide was specifically found under the one meal per day diet group. Further analysis showed that the common core pathway for calorie restriction and only one meal per day group is the saline, glycine, theonine metabolic axis that interrelate with a large number of pathways many of which are fed by mitochondrial supply energy. These findings support the idea that protection, repair, replacement, and event are involved in keeping an organism young. Direct comparison uh, between the different feeding strategy also unveil that short chain fatty acid pathway and hence the gut microbiota also play an important role in improved health. This finding were also recapitulated in the serum metabolome from non-human primate, suggesting that this mechanism could be conserved from an evolutionary perspective and potentially replicate in human. So overall, these results are consistent with the current paradigm that calorie restriction response have evolved as an adaptive pro-longevity response to food scarcity. Where below a certain resources threshold, organism will reallocate energy almost exclusively towards somatic maintenance and allowing organism to survive the bulk of famines. So in order to stay healthy to our old age, the least we should do is not only not to overeat and not eating unhealthy food, we must also not feast too frequently in order for the repair and maintenance mechanism to kick in. As the saying goes, we must always stay hungry for success, literally. Well, that's all. Thanks for listening. Now back to Prof. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Xiaoping. Uh, before we start the uh, seminar by Steve, I want to remind everyone to use the Q&A function to ask questions, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the session. Uh, I'm really excited today to have Steve Horvath. Uh, he's a professor of human genetics and biostatistics at, universe, at UCLA. Um, and uh, his lab does a wide array of different kinds of science. But what really has, I think, uh, been exciting to me is the, the biomarker work that's been done to try to measure biologic aging. Uh, in the last couple decades, we've come up with a number of interventions that may slow the aging process, but it's extremely difficult to understand whether they're likely to work in humans. I think the groundbreaking work that Steve and his colleagues have done have really set the stage now for us to measure whether interventions work in slowing or reversing the aging process. So I've asked Steve to be the first speaker in a series of talks we're gonna have on biomarkers of aging. Uh, and I'm really excited that he could join us. Uh, his talk is Epigenetic Clocks for Clinical and Preclinical Applications. Uh, and so take it away, Steve. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, it's a real privilege and honor to present to you today. Um, I'll talk about preclinical studies in mammals, clinical studies um, using my favorite mammal, humans. Um, what recent methylation studies have revealed is that the DNA molecule is really a gigantic aging clock. 
really in all nucleated cells. And this statement pertains really to all species. I will talk today about cytosine methylation, which plays a very important role in the development um, of vertebrates. I emphasize vertebrates because cytosine methylation cannot be observed in important invertebrates, such as um, C. elegans, a worm, or Drosophila. But methylation plays an important role in development. It's widely acknowledged, but uh, recent studies also show that it plays a role in aging. Um, we use many different platforms for um, studying methylation. Um, in particular, we use um, so-called Infinium arrays from Illumina. Um, often the human chip, the so-called EPIC chip that measures 860,000 locations in the DNA. But um, a lot of work that I present today was generated on a custom mammalian chip uh, that is available. Um, for all mammalian species, any species uh, that you can think of uh, can be profiled on that array. We are looking at 37,000 highly conserved cytosines across these mammalian species. And um, to briefly remind people, uh, back in 2013, um, I presented the so-called pan-tissue epigenetic clock, which really stands out in the sense that it applies to all sources of DNA. All um, organs can be profiled by it, which is quite remarkable because um, many other um, omics data do not have that feature. For example, you cannot build a pan tissue clock on the basis of proteins or, or metabolites and so on. So it's kind of uh, remarkable that this is feasible across tissues. And um, here I show this concept that if your methylation age on the y-axis is higher than expected based on your chronologic age, then you had a higher risk of certain uh, diseases. Conversely, if your epigenetic age estimated, for example, using blood or, or saliva or other tissues is lower than um, expected, then um, this is often good news. But there was always the question whether epigenetic, um, if you allow me to go back, um, th this distance from the regression line is what we call age acceleration. So mathematically it's a residual, but um, if you, it's higher then you have positive age acceleration. If it's uh, lower than expected, you have negative age acceleration. And one question that I always had was, um, how does age acceleration in one tissue, such as blood, relate to age acceleration in another tissue, for example, muscle, right? In other words, if you give me um, a blood sample and a muscle biopsy and an adipose tissue sample from the same person, um, do these measures of age acceleration correlate across organs? And so recently I um, generated a data set from almost a hundred people where um, these, uh, that allowed me to answer that. And I show you here pairwise correlations of tissue. So interestingly, blood um, is actually quite re representative of many organs, you know? So you see age acceleration in blood is correlated uh, um, of, um, with a Pearson correlation of 0.62 with epigenetic age acceleration in lung correlation 0.51 in adipose, um, 0 0.47, uh, 0 0.42 in kidney, but interestingly, low correlations in liver, you know? So from that, I learned that epigenetic age acceleration in blood is not informative about your liver, you know? And um, now I consider these conservative estimates of preservation because there is some technical noise. Um, one thing I learned was that heart tissue is, um, has only weak correlation with many other tissue types, you know. Um, moving on. One question I always had was, well, which age-related conditions, what measures of pathology correlate with age acceleration in different tissues? Because there's quite a lot of literature in blood. I mean, many age-related conditions are associated with age acceleration in blood, but what about other tissue? 
And, and one thing that really came out to a great surprise to me was really hypertension stood out. So you see in the upper bars that hypertension was associated with age acceleration in adipose tissue, in kidney tissue, in liver tissue, even muscle tissue. Why am I surprised? Because when I looked at blood tissue, hypertension had, had only a relatively weak effect, you know, but in other tissues, um, much stronger. Um, you also see other conditions. Diabetes study uh, status is associated with age acceleration in liver. By contrast, diabetes has a much weaker association with age acceleration in blood. You know, and so you can look at these various conditions. Um, cardiovascular disease is associated with age acceleration in lung, and what we learn from that is that many conditions are associated with epigenetic age acceleration in non-blood tissues, you know, and um, which is kind of depressing because it means you should really profile many tissues in a person. One thing that is quite uh, persistent in different organs is the effect of sex. So um, being a man, I'm not happy about the finding that males age really faster than women in many organs. You see here, um, these are relatively small sample sizes, but the pattern is quite consistent. It's always the blue bar for men is higher than the pink bar for females, you know, so age acceleration is higher, especially in muscle tissue, we observe a very strong effect, spleen, and, uh, and so on. I want to come to a different topic, um, what some people have dubbed the central question of biology. Why do similar species such as mammals have markedly different maximum lifespans? There's a vast literature on that. Um, um, one of the findings is typically bigger animals live longer lives. Uh, so lots of ecological studies, animals that fly live longer and so on. But I want to show you the results of an epigenetic study. So we generated these methylation data from 172 different mammalian species. Here are the Latin names, 172 species. And we built um, a prediction model, a penalized regression model to estimate the maximum lifespan on the y-axis versus the predicted value. Needless to say, this is a completely unbiased analysis. This is a so-called leave one species out cross-validation. This is an unbiased assessment. And you observe the correlation of 0.88. I mean, it's mind boggling that you can use methylation to very accurately predict the lifespan. Why is it mind boggling? Because maximum lifespan data are very inaccurate. You can, for some animals, we know maximum lifespan very well. Humans, right? Human maximum lifespan around 122. Um, but for many animals, it's, um, there's substantial noise. But uh, what you can see, despite of that noise in the maximum lifespan, we still get very high correlations for, um, uh, for the prediction. And what does that mean? It, it means if you give me a blood sample from any animal, you don't tell me what animal it is. You tell me nothing about it. Um, I run my methylation array. I can predict the maximum lifespan of that animal. Um, the same statement, interestingly, pertains to gestational time. Methylation allows you to predict gestational time. It allows you to predict age at sexual maturity. Actually, many species uh, characteristics. But uh, because I'm an aging researcher, I'm particularly fascinated by maximum lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about um, epigenetic clocks for mammals. So now we're talking about measuring chronologic age, not lifespan, uh, ma not maximum lifespan. And um, I just present a curious clock. So this is now an epigenetic clock that applies to tissues both from human and rats, okay? So meaning you give me a blood sample from a rat or a blood sample of humans, I want to measure the age using one mathematical formula. And um, this is possible. And um, there's a statistical trick. So um, one way to address it is you form a measure of relative age that I describe here. So relative age is simply the chronologic age divided by maximum lifespan. 
And by mathematical definition, that value lies between zero and one. For example, uh, the maximum lifespan in rats is 3.8 years. And so anyway, relative age puts these two uh, species with very different maximum lifespans on the same footing. And here I show you the results. The left panel shows you um, um, the results of mixing, so to speak, rat samples with human samples. And um, the, uh, the green dots are human tissue samples, the red dots are rat samples, and it's one, one clock, you know, <laughs> and you see a correlation 0.95, it's uh, very accurate. Um, the right panel shows you um, an excerpt of the data, it's basically only rat tissues, and now these points are colored by tissue type, you know. And, um, but it is quite remarkable that you can take these evolutionarily very distant animals, different lifespan, and have one clock that applies to both species. I mentioned as an aside, why do we build these clocks? Why do we build human rat clocks? Well, the goal is, of course, to evaluate anti-aging intervention. <clears throat> and here I show you a study from Harold Katcher and Akshay Sangavi, who develop, developed a plasma fraction treatment. And according to these uh, human rat clocks, this treatment halved the ages of rat tissues uh, um, in blood, liver, and heart. I mean, it's a, 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 um, a treatment that um, is almost too good to be true. You know, if, if somebody had told me you can observe such strong effect, I wouldn't have believed it. And um, now we're in the middle of uh, trying to replicate it. So we, we will do follow-up uh, studies, both in rats, but also dogs in order to replicate that finding. I need to emphasize it's not yet published, not yet peer reviewed. Um, what about the naked mole rat? The naked mole rat is um, a very interesting animal to aging researchers because it appears to have negligent senescence. And in theory, I thought maybe it's not possible to build an epigenetic clock for naked mole rats. Maybe they are just no methylation changes. But um, after collaborating um, with Vera Gorbunova, Chris Fox, and others, um, we have now developed very accurate clocks for naked mole rat, really for most tissues, kidney, skin, liver, blood. So at least at an epigenetic level, these animals age. And what is interesting, is even young animals age, you know, because a uh, naked mole rat um, is supposedly the oldest animal ever lived till age 37. So one may think that early on there is no aging, but um, you perhaps can appreciate looking at the x-axis, even between um, zero to 10 years, there's actually quite some change. Um, I want to talk now about um, so-called a universal mammalian clock. So um, that very much extends the study of humans and rats, because you could say, why not build a clock that applies to all mammals? And we had um, data from 130 mammalian species where we had age inf information, and we built several clocks. Let me start with our worst clock. I call it the naive universal clock. Um, why is it naive? Because it's the statistical analysis was naive. We simply take the chronologic age of the animals and do a log transformation. And then we regress that um, log transform age on cytosine methylation. And um, Interestingly, even this naive approach leads to very high correlations in a, a cross-validation approach, uh, correlation 0.96. Um, I want to explain the, the labels. Um, each dot is labeled by species. So um, 1.1, 1, .1, 1 stands for primates, primate number one is humans. But um, we have, of course, all these other species that are listed here, pigs, um, elephants, mice, um, blind mole rat, and so on, tigers, and uh, many marine mammals, beluga whale, bowhead whale, and so on. And even this naive approach is, really leads to this very high correlation. Um, but um, the naive clock is not the one I would use. Um, 
So we developed um, two other clocks um, for placental mammals. I prefer these clocks because they are simply more accurate, you know. So the correlation score 0.98, you know, so very high accuracy for clock number two and clock number three. And uh, one thing I do need to mention is a limitation was that we did not have enough marsupial samples, you know. Most of our animals are placental mammals, so called eutherians. And so our clocks are particularly accurate for placental mammals. I, um, we have a clock for marsupials, but um, it's kind of work in progress. Yeah. Um, I want to um, now come to humans, our favorite animal, of course, <clears throat> and mention that uh, we um, and others have developed new clocks that really hone in on pro predicting mortality risk or morbidity risk. So moving away from estimating chronologic age, we want to measure and predict mortality risk and morbidity. And these sometimes we call it second generation epigenetic clocks. And um, well-known um, clocks are called Pheno age and Grim age. And um, Grim age, uh, Grim age is named after the Grim Reaper uh, um, because it's our best mortality predictor. And um, we are quite enthusiastic about this biomarker because it has been validated in, in a dozen different papers by independent research groups, many different populations. Um, so all of these papers show strong correlations between this blood-based clock, blood marker, and many measures of morbidity, anything from lung function, cognitive decline, kidney dysfunction, and so on. But these were cross-sectional associations. Um, the new uh, um, hurdle to take for these biomarkers is longitudinal studies. Um, we need to um, relate rate of change in, for example, grim age to increased hazard of death. And why do we need to do it? Well, we need to establish causality. We need to convince us and the others that these biomarkers truly um, um, uh, relate to biologic age. Um, we have also done very large scale GWAS studies um, of epigenetic clocks that allowed us to develop polygenic risk scores for these uh, Grim age and other clocks. And these uh, polygenic risk scores are um, publicly available. So I invite you to evaluate these um, risk scores in your own SNP data. Um, we and others work now on analytical validation. So we need to um, ensure that uh, the test retest variable variability is minimal. And um, I can already tell you that Grimage um, has exceptionally high intra-class correlation in all blood data. So um, it's, it, in my worldview, Grimage is ready for prime time in human clinical trials. So um, Grim age stands out with predicting time to death, time to coronary heart disease, even time to cancer, early menopause. And um, excitingly, these clocks are already being used in um, human clinical trials. There's a study, um, it a, was a small study, a phase one clinical trial uh, by Greg Fahey and Bobby Brook, who um, evaluated um, a novel treatment to regenerate the thymus. Um, the thymus gland um, 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 trains the T cells in your blood um, to become fully mature. And um, so Greg Fay developed a cocktail for regenerating the thymus. In, um, but there was a very interesting side effect of that, um, a positive side effect. This cocktail actually ended up rejuvenating the blood according to epigenetic clocks. <clears throat> so here each panel um, corresponds to a different epigenetic clock. For example, panel D is grim age. And what um, we found was that after 12 months, the um, treatment had reversed the grim age by two and a half years, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in essence, it would suggest that you stopped aging, the aging process of blood tissue. And um, I also want to mention these um, 
changes appear to be independent of blood cell composition. And um, now um, we have started <clears throat> a follow-up study because the original study had the limitation that it only involved nine people. So now we have a follow-up study where we hope to enroll more than 85 people. And hopefully a year from now, I can tell you the results, whether all of that validated. So to conclude my presentation, um, we have managed to build an epigenetic clock for each mammalian species that we analyzed. All correlate very strongly with chronologic age. I think earlier I mentioned also methylation is a wonderful correlate of maximum lifespan. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is that the human clocks very much differ in predictive accuracy for mortality risk. For example, my original pan tissue clock is not a good predictor of mortality risk. Um, by contrast, grim age would be a good predictor. Um, it, the, the methylation clocks will not replace standard biomarkers from the clinic. So um, you will always want to measure things like blood pressure, lipid levels, glucose measures, whole, the whole battery of clinical biomarkers. Uh, they, it, it won't ever replace them. Um, my talk, of course, focuses on methylation, but um, just to be clear, there are many other exciting biomarkers of aging beyond methylation, the proteomics and so on. Um, if you do uh, measure methylation in your study, you want to carefully think about the source of DNA. Most people study blood, but several treatments such as rapamycin, or also postmenopausal hormone therapy have a much stronger effect um, in buccal epithelial cells, in essence, keratinocytes. You know? So um, methylation clearly differs from one cell type to the next. So think about what, what is the right tissue. I mentioned also fat tissue here. It's easier to collect. Um, urine is also an option. Um, if you prepare it properly, you can extract DNA from urine. And um, here's my acknowledgement slide. I, I have many wonderful collaborators, Ken Raj and um, many others. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, that was great. And I think it raises a, a lot of interesting uh, points of discussion. Part of me wants to start uh, on your conclusion slide because I want to like address some sort of general issues before we get into details. And you mentioned that there are a lot of other clocks out there. Um, you know, and, and based on other omics, transcriptomics, and all kinds of other things as well, uh, clinical markers. Uh, is first of all, why did you choose methylation? Do you think methylation inherently is going to be better than these other clocks, or for some biologic reason, or there was a, or or is it just that it's been probed more deeply with methylation? Um, well, I would formulate it this way. I never wanted to study methylation. You know, I had a massive bias against methylation. And the reason is methylation is quite far removed from a protein, right? Biology happens at the level of proteins. And um, so I was quite hesitant to even embrace methylation. I, I came to methylation as an accident in certain ways. <laughs> I did somebody a favor and then stumbled across the fact that Methylation has a very strong association with chronologic age. You know, if you are um, a bioinformatician and um, your collaborators hand you ten data sets, one is methylation, and they ask you build predictors of age, you will invariably conclude methylation is your best, most informative biomarker for chronologic age. There's just no comparison. You know, now um, the question though is is it the biologically most interesting measure, right? Because um, um, this relates to the question, is it a good indicator of biologic age? You know? And in general, this is an ill-posed problem <laughs> because nobody knows what is meant by biological age. You know, it's, uh, and, um, but yeah, um, so my opinion is um, methylation alone should, uh, is not sufficient, you know, for many studies, you know, and um, especially methylation in blood alone. I think I showed you slides where I showed um, maybe 
methylation in muscle tissue seem to have a much stronger relationship with morbidity. I didn't talk about it, you know, but uh, um, so um, my opinion is um, it methylation in blood alone is probably not sufficient for many studies, you know. Conversely, though, I will make that statement that I think the vast majority of aging studies should measure methylation. You know, I think it's fair to say that it's one of the best validated biomarkers by now. You know, it's also not that expensive. And so if you don't include it in your battery of assessments, you, you miss an opportunity, you know. So I will, um, what I like about methylation is that it's a fundamental property of the DNA molecule. And I think I've shown you that um, it allows you to measure age in all tissues, in all cell types. And that very much um, um, uh, is consistent with the view that aging happens everywhere, you know? And so if you have this, uh, this theory that aging happens in all tissues, and more than that, if you have the, um, the assumption that all animals age, all mammals age, right? And suddenly you have a biomarker, a single formula that measure one formula that measures aging in a mouse, in an elephant, you know, in all these mammals, yeah. you know, it, 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 it suggests there's, it really captures something really innate, you know, about aging, which is very exciting, you know, to me. Um, now, yeah. but, but what's the drawback? The biologic insight, you know, coming back to my original bias, you know, because we want to know, well, what pathways are involved, you know, and uh, there we need to um, continue to do research. In. Well, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll follow on on that a little bit. I mean, you mentioned that, well, I mean, I, th I think a lot of us still debate how much of aging is tissue specific and how much of it is systemic. And what does systemic aging mean? Is it just driven by factors in the blood? Uh, it's interesting that, you know, there was a lot of correlation with the blood and other tissues. And maybe is that picking out the, some of the systemic effects of aging in the blood? Or what's your view on the whole concept of systemic and tissue specific drivers of aging and, and mortality? Yeah, I, um, I agree with your uh, interpretation. You know, I, I was on some level surprised that blood methylation correlated quite well with um, epigenetic aging in other tissues, you know, because in theory, it could have been that a totally different organ shows a much better uh, correlation, right? Um, if you talk to people who study muscle aging, they will say muscle is the most important yeah. organ. If you talk to people who study kidney, they will say the ultimate um, organ is kidney function, you know. Yeah, yeah. So in theory, anything is possible. So I was actually quite happy that methylation in blood seems so cor uh, correlated with other tissues. Um, I mean, it would be wonderful if it was as simple as um, modulating systemic factors and then rejuvenating many organs. You know, I think that would be a, a, a dream. You know, if it was as simple as that. Um, hopefully, it will pan out. Um, I don't um, think, but uh, many people do research on that topic right now. Hopefully, we will know in a couple of years. You know, mm. have you thought about uh, trying to link the you, you know measured aging in a lot of different tissues, as you said? Can you build sort of a network out of that based on connectivity between tissues or even between looking at the differences that went into the, the, the measurements that were, I know they're driven by machine learning, but you know, you can go back after the fact and see what was important in the diagnosis. And so I'm wondering if that can be used to sort of build a network for a connectivity pathway of aging. Yeah. I mean, in a former life, I developed a tool called Weighted Correlation Network Analysis, and that's very much um, kind of a wonderful application. But many other software tools, you know, um, for correlating um, in general omics data in one organ to that of another, you know, I think that's a very exciting exercise you know, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you, you can even imagine trying to manipulate, at least in the animal models, certain pathways of aging and then correlating that back to the different tissues and measures of aging that you've developed and to try to go beyond just a network of tissues and, and try to link that to the pathways we think are connected to aging. I'm wondering if there's a, there's a, a, a path to go down that could really try to connect. Because you know we have these 
hallmarks and pillars of aging. We think we know a lot of the pathways that modulate aging. It would be great if there was a way to connect those up to, you know, bi these biologic measures. I agree. You know, I briefly showed the data from the thymus regeneration trial, right? And um, we looked at other biomarkers of various organs, you know, so, uh, um, and many organs showed improvement, you know, and um, so um, some people may now claim if once you regenerate the thymus, you really touch many other organs, you know. Now, now then, you know, there's a wonderful literature where people study the hypothalamus, you know, in, in mice. And then um, if you rejuvenate the hypothalamus or certain stem cells, that rejuvenates the mouse, you know, there's, um, but um, then other people will argue, uh, they did these experiments, right, in female mice where they replaced the ovaries by those yeah. of a young ma. So these are all very exciting studies, you know. Um, it would be kind of interesting to see which kind of organs or tissues have to be rejuvenated so that you rejuvenate most of the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. yeah, if we could take a step back, you know, I think at least the original biomarkers had chronologic age as a as a data component in the in the development of the machine learning approach, um, and then the divergence, as you mentioned, from the chronologic ages and individual, you know, it, at one level, you, you, what we want to say is that's the biologic age or or how, a measure of how well the person's aging. And, you know, mathematically, it's essentially the error from the measurement of the chronologic age. And so, how do you think about that? And and maybe a follow-on question to that is. Is it possible to overfit the data? I mean, I, I, the reason I ask that is that if you look at people like at 50 years of age, I don't think any of us know, but I would guess that there's a significant amount of difference in biologic aging among a group of individuals in that age range. And, and you can measure something down to an error of a couple of years. Um, uh, are we all aging more similarly or is it, are we, yeah, are we I mean, just uh, besides aging, what, where do you stand on that? Yeah, um, I mean, just to be clear, I do not have any epigenetic clocks that would have an error of two years and 50 years old, not at all, you know. Well, my, so, all of my clocks would have an error plus minus six, seven years, you know. So uh, that's probably more. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, but, um, you know, the age prediction is particularly uh, accurate in younger people, you know, then as we age, there are substantial discrepancies. And, um, but in theory, um, there's something, uh, I think it was called a paradox of biomarkers of aging. And that was, you do want a very accurate marker for chronologic age, but not too accurate, okay? <laughs> That's basically it, you know, it's conflicting goals. Because if you have the perfectly accurate estimate of chronologic age, it will be uninteresting. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but it, um, so um, I, I I do think there are opportunities, you know, for people um, to, in certain ways, come up with clocks that are actually not that accurate, you know, but they capture organ dysfunction and um, you know they're better morbidity predictors there, there's quite some op uh, there are opportunities to do it conversely um, do we need even more accurate estimators of chronologic age probably not you know because um, we I mean, we have clocks that have correlations 0.95, you know, okay, so now you publish a clock with correlation 0.96, you know, <laughs> the improvement yeah, is marginal, you know, it's more about um, uh, perhaps clocks that um, 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 have better um, biological interpretations, you know, where you more clearly um, um, can interpret, for example, that they me uh, measure stem cell properties, you know, or clocks that relate to inflammation and other hallmarks. You know. mm. do, do you think a methylation is, is it a, just a marker or is it a driver? And uh, I think we've talked about this before, you know, are, is there anything that can be gleaned from the specific methylation sites that are being measured or, or, or weighted uh, highly in these different clocks? Yeah, um, there are a couple of um, um, clear insights. And one of them is that 
the cytosines often relate to developmental processes, you know, and that's probably one of the deepest insights that came out of these epigenetic clocks is that, um, remember how I showed they apply to children, they apply to prenatal samples, you know, mm -hmm. think um, periods in life that we do not associate with aging at all, you know, and, um, but if you really drill deeper, that's often what you find, you know, that these cytosines are located in genomic locations that on the one hand um, play an important role for maintaining stemness of stem cells or conversely um, relate to uh, cell differentiation, you know. And um, so one can think about it, what it means, you know, and, uh, and also along those lines, you, you wonder why is it possible to build epigenetic clocks that apply to all mammals, you know, why? Well, what's shared? Development. Development is quite similar between mammals, you know. So um, that's kind of the broad insight, you know, I would say. But um, when it comes to the question of causality, I would say, Clearly, many cytosines will not have any causal effect whatsoever with aging, you know. Why there are 28 million cytosines in humans, uh, a quarter of them change with aging, you know. Probably many of them, it's just pure entropy. Um, conversely, though, I, I have seen beautiful papers, you know, where people really drill very deeply in age-related changes of, let's say, a couple of cytosines, you know, and then they argue that, yes, the methylation of these five cytosines really did affect gene expression, really did lead to that pathology, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think in reality, the answer will be um, messy, you know, there will be many cytosines, no consequences, but there will be some that truly have substantial aging phenotypes, you know. You mentioned different species. I, I was confused a little bit by the naked mole rat data. So you measure aging. Um, they have arguably negligible senescence. Um, what does that mean? I mean, one, one interpretation may be that they're biologic aging, but there's some disconnect downstream that keeps that from affecting pathology in some way. I, I, uh, that's the only thing that came to my mind in a short period of time. But how do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, we should have this conversation. There are many interpretations, you know, one is exactly what you said that um, there is damage that accumulates, but the naked mole rat can somehow uh, deal with yeah. that. You know? Maybe, yeah. um, that's one interpretation. But there's also a totally different interpretation. It would say, well, maybe these cytosines really don't have any consequence, you know, they, they, they don't lead to uh, pathology, you know, so, um, they, yeah, so that's the other interpretation. Um, it, I it, wonder it, if it, interventions would affect it in that, in, yes. in naked mole rats. Um, yeah, I, but you know, for me, um, a very important question is whether there are certain organs in the naked mole rat or tissues that do not show that effect, you know? So, um, and that's what we're currently working on. That's why we haven't uh, finished the project yet, you know? Um, I, it could be that certain tissues do not show aging effects on methylation, you know? Yeah, that and, would be um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, uh, come back to this question of, you know, continuing to improve upon the clocks. One way to think about it is, can you make a more personalized clock? I, and I know that kind of runs against the way the system is set up, but, you know, w the way I think about it is that there are many things modulating the aging process and some individuals are going to be out of, you know, normal range in some pathways and others and others. Is there a way to get a hold of that data in some kind of a clock like you've developed? Yeah, um, you know, one could in certain ways design a study, you know, where you really track a very carefully, there are many phenotypes, deep phenotyping, you know, and also uh, different sources of DNA, let's say blood, buccal cells, perhaps uh, skin, you know, and um, measure that really in many people to give you a number 5,000 people you know and I do think if you had such a foundational data set you know one could um, build much uh, more powerful clocks you know 
Um, you know, we are often limited by what is available. So many of these clocks were really based on epidemiological cohorts yeah. that were designed 30 years ago, you know, and um, where people collected blood, you know. Nowadays, one would say, please uh, collect many other tissues, you know. But, mm. Yeah, I just want to conclude. I think the rat human data is quite interesting too. Um, and I, my first thought there was you were trying to just get a better assessment of aging in like certain groups of humans, like politicians or something like that. But, <laughs> um, but actually it turns out to be very exciting. Are you going to look at other species combinations like that? I don't, you know, because it's too much work. I mean, I, I, I could do it for any combination, you know, <laughs> but I, I, my favorite species is always humans. I relate everything to humans, you know, so that's why I always um, include that, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Well, great. Thank you. You know, I, I want to bring in a Jomin Go. Uh, for people who have watched the previous versions of uh, the webinars, we always have someone who works uh, in the uh, Healthy Longevity Program at NUS that's uh, assisting to ask the questions from the audience. And I've asked Jorming, who's a research professor at, at NUS, to do it for the biomarker series because he's really organizing our clinical studies uh, on human aging at, at NUS. And so he's been thinking a lot about this. And so thanks for doing this, Jorming. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, it's very nice to listen to your talk, Dr. Havev. You know, I've read a lot of your work and some of our studies are going to be based on DNA methylation. So uh, I think we have quite a number of very interesting questions from the audience today. Um, you know, some from very, very general, very broad perspectives to very detailed um, questions on the experiments you've done. So I'll kick, uh, I'll kick off by asking this question from uh, one member of our lab, uh, Hatay Tip. The question is, do you think that age-related epigenetic changes are influenced more by intrinsic or environmental factors? And I could also follow up on that on, you know, have twin studies actually done DNA methylation studies? And uh, what is the insight from that? Would you, would you be able to comment? Yeah, sure. You know, I'm an identical twin and I um, measured my epigenetic age when I turned 51 and that of my identical twin brother. You know? And then according to Grimm age, we had the identical age, 48.9, I think. <laughs> but not according to my pan tissue clock. There was quite a lot of this. I think I was four years older than my brother. And <laughs> But um, what I do want to say is that overall twins are much more similar with respect to epigenetic age. And it reflects that epigenetic age is actually under substantial genetic control. To give you a number, maybe 30 to 40% of the variation in epigenetic age is genetic. Um, but to answer your question, I do think um, about innate versus various environmental stress factors, you know. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's really innate, you know. It's not stress factors. Uh, I could be wrong, but it's just my gut instinct. And the, the reason is because, um, for one thing, the clocks are so accurate, even in children, you know, and I just don't see what kind of factors would affect children. They play, you can measure epigenetic age in, in a dish, you know, you can have some carotenocytes or fibroblasts, you can measure aging in that system, you know. So um, I, I don't think it relates to external factors, but um, who knows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's mostly intrinsically, or you could say that it's genetically determined. Yeah, I would say it's uh, mostly intrinsic. Mm -hmm. there, there, I, I mean, there's a cottage industry in um, epidemiology where people relate epigenetic aging to anything from air pollution, you know, and uh, of course, uh, diet and so on. And these studies tend to find associations, you know, and um, believable associations, but they're always very small. You know, the, the, the correlations are always weak. And so um, they only modulate it. And this goes along the intuition that if you have a person who leads the perfect lifestyle, imagine you are on a tropical island, no stress, you sleep, you exercise, no like pollution. Singapore. You will age, right? <laughs> oh, Singapore, that's right. That's, um, that's true. I've heard you have a paradise over there. So, <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> in, uh, but people still age if you look around, right? <laughs> and um, 
Well, yeah, <laughs> although you have wonderful food, you still age. So um, there is something innate, you know, that drives aging. And I do think the clocks, the epigenetic clocks relate to that innate aging. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Hover, since you brought up the uh, topic of, you know, island paradise, there are these reports of different blue zones, right? You know, areas in the world where there are exceptionally long-lived uh, centenarians. So, you know, places that come to mind remind me of, uh, for example, Sardinia or even Okinawa. Now, has epigenetic aging been tested in such populations? Are, are you aware of any of those, of any of those studies? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm aware of small studies. So I looked at Italian centenarians. So Italy is a, one of these blue zones, but not Sardinians, you know. And uh, in the centenary, the, the, centen the offspring of centenarians were younger. Doesn't quite answer your question. You know? Um, but beyond that, I've never studied these populations you mentioned. I mean, it would be super interesting to uh, apply these clocks to Okinawa, for example, as you said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have another question from the floor, and it's from Yen Gruber. And the question is that um, it is quite interesting that hypertension is correlated with epigenetic age in tissues that are not typically th thought to be linked directly to the cardiovascular system, for example, um, the adipose tissue. So yes. do you have a sense regarding the ultimate cause of these changes? Now, is it that hypertension is a factor that increases aging in all tissues, or is it that people that age faster have both high blood pressure and increased epigenetic aging in the adipose tissue? Yeah, you know, I cannot um, comment on that. It's a causal statement, you know. I think the, the way to do it would be to perhaps use SNP markers as instrumental variables, maybe Mendelian randomization, you know, um, or a longitudinal study, but I really don't know. What I can tell you, as I mentioned, the correlation between hypertension and uh, blood age acceleration was really relatively weak, you know. So that's why this this just came out of nowhere, this finding. And I'm as puzzled as, as everyone else is. You know? But hypertension really stood out as the one a morbid condition, you know, that really accelerated aging in all these other organs. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. We have one more question from the floor, and it's from Bibek. Mm -hmm. What do you think um, about the differences in age acceleration between males and females? Could it be due to differences in uh, uh, hormones, body composition, fat mass, or, you know, uh, composition of muscle mass? Would you be able to comment? Uh, I mean, um, yeah, so let's say, I, I do think hormones play a role, you know, because I keep finding uh, um, insights surrounding various hormone treatments, you know, and I haven't quite nailed it down, you know, because hormones are just so complicated and many hormones, you know, I mentioned the thymus regeneration, that was based on growth hormones, you know, and that seemed to have a beneficial effect. Then um, at, at some point I studied menopausal hormone therapy in women and that rejuvenated, um, for example, keratinocytes, but not blood, you know. And conversely, women who enter menopause early, they tend to um, have accelerated aging, you know. And so, um, so I, I keep seeing themes for hormones, you know, but it's complex, you know. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no good answer for you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, maybe we'll just go through one more question from the floor. Um, and the question is, in your studies, you looked at cytosine uh, methylation. Is there a reason why you didn't look at adenine methylation? Yeah, you know, it's strictly a technical reason, you know, because people have developed uh, very robust ways of measuring cytosine methylation. Um, but, you know, adenine methylation would be very exciting in, in certain ver invertebrates, you know. There's some literature where people suggest that C. elegans has adenine methylation, you know. And so every three years I fire out an email where, to people and say, can you measure adenine methylation accurately, you know, because the minute somebody can measure it accurately, I would love to use it to build a clock in C. elegans or other invertebrates, you know. So uh, thank you, Jarming, uh, uh, for the great questions. And thanks a lot, Steve. This was a really exciting discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I want to remind everyone that uh, they can go to the chat room and continue the discussion after the talk if they like. Um, 
This is my last uh, uh, webinar from the U.S. I've been back traveling in the U.S. and I'm in Park City, Utah right now, but I'll be quarantined uh, and, or in other words, locked in a hotel room in Singapore next week. So I'll see you from there. Uh, and you should come back next week because we have Jackie Hahn from Peking University who'll be continuing discussions of biomarkers and aging. Uh, and I think that's very exciting. Uh, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, as you know, we typically leave you with a little vignette from someone you've probably heard of. Uh, and so this, for this week, we chose to uh, pick a rock star who never seems to age. And so we uh, are going to show you a, a small video about what he does to keep being satisfying. Thank you very much. This was the image right after Mick Jagger underwent medical treatment, reportedly for a heart valve issue, saying, thank you, everyone, for your messages of support. I'm feeling much better on the men. Mick Jagger, famous for racing across the stage, it's been said he performs the equivalent of 12 miles in a single performance. And tonight, the new video from Mick Jagger, out to prove he's back. <laughs> 75 years young, singing and moving in that studio. The rock legend tweeting the video out today, just six weeks after his treatment. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. 